My background is that I am a mechanical engineer. I am an alumnus of this institute of IIT Madras. And um, the whole thing started around 2005 as a uh, investigative project by IIT Madras, where we were trying to see how to leverage information and communication technology to cover people who are not uh, covered by banks towards financial inclusion. And uh, when we did this investigation, uh, we tried different options using the internet access points as places from where people could avail loans or maybe insurance and things like that. And finally came to the conclusion that um, you need to have the equivalent of a bank branch, which does the bread and butter transactions of deposits and uh, dispensation, withdrawal, uh, for the bank to actually own a customer and uh, build a credit history and then later on sell all the other value added products like loans and other things. And uh, this was uh, not possible in the conventional model of brick and mortar branches obviously because the number of transactions would be very few and the ticket size of each transaction would be small. And when we uh, tried to see how we could address it through technology, the obvious solution was to uh, replace a bank with an ATM. But then we found that a conventional ATM doesn't work for a number of reasons. Um, for one, um, the places where we put the, uh, wanted to put the ATMs uh, were chronically power deficit. There were long hours of power outage. Uh, and uh, this meant that you needed a huge uh, backup power, diesel generator, and the cost was simply unaffordable. That was one problem. And uh, the other issue was that unless the quality of currency is very good, the paper notes tended to get jammed. And then you needed to bring um, a specialized person in an armored truck. And reaching this place would take a day. And until then, the thing will be out of service. Uh, so we needed a machine which can reliably handle commonly used uh, qualities of currency, because you are not going to get new and crisp notes from a bank chest in these remote locations. And like this, I could go on and on. We found that basically we needed half a dozen new features at least to um, uh, make an ATM functional in the kind of locations where we wanted to put it. And that's when we said, OK, we need to build an ATM meant for Indian conditions ground up. And uh, that's how the whole thing started about 2005, 2006. The challenge was big that we wanted to um, uh, make um, an order of magnitude difference in lot of the performance specs. We wanted to bring down the power by 100 fold or at least 10 fold and things like that. Um, the, obviously, if I had uh, looked at a conventional design and then seen uh, how to do modifications in it, it would be practically impossible. Um, fortunately, uh, I or the other people in our team had no idea about how legacy ATMs worked. And so we were able to think afresh. And uh, what we did was try to model the entire mechanism uh, on the basis of how we count currency using our fingers, which is just a few watts of power. Fingers can't generate more than a few watts of power. Whereas uh, ATMs at that time were taking close to 1,000 watts. Uh, and for an engineered product, it's uh, a shame that what you can do with a few watts, uh, you should spend 1,000 watts. And what compounded the problem was that uh, the entire mechanism had to be in a thick steel shell for security reasons. And a 1,000 watts consumption meant 1,000 watts of heat being generated. And that would make the entire mechanism and the electronics uh, malfunction um, or stop functioning. So in order to keep the machine cool, you needed to invest another couple of 1,000 watts for air conditioning the whole place uh, so the temperature buildup doesn't happen. And um, so we felt that if we could bring down the power to a few tens of watts, uh, including the monitor and everything, then uh, you, you wouldn't even require cooling, so you don't need air conditioning. There'll be no temperature buildup. And that's the kind of solution that would fly. And uh, so we modeled everything after how a human teller would dispense currency and built a mechanism that mimics that action and uh, use natural forces like gravity and other things to the best advantage so that you don't have to have heavy powered motors. And uh, our philosophy in building the mechanism was less is better. So we probably have 10 times fewer parts 
in our design than any conventional ATM that you will find in the world. And the fewer the parts you have, uh, not only are you more energy efficient, uh, you also have, uh, you are also probably much more than 10 times more reliable. So there is hardly any breakdown possibility because more parts means more things can go wrong. And uh, when things go wrong in a um, remote location, the turnaround time to fix it is much larger. So if you have to maintain what is called the uptime or the availability uh, of the ATM, then you need to have something which is very reliable, uh, has very low failure rates, and that's possible only with having very few parts. And as a consequence of all that, of course, the cost also went down. You're using less power, less parts, uh, smaller sized motors. So the overall cost of manufacturing also comes down. So we didn't start off by explicitly focusing on a price advantage, but the price advantage was a fallout of energy efficiency and reliability. In some ways, commercializing was a bigger challenge than even building the technology uh, because the ATM is uh, not a standalone product. It is something that plugs into a pre-existing ecosystem of the financial uh, architecture of a bank. Uh, the bank already has what's called a core banking system and then the ATM connects to it through an ATM switch. And a lot of these, there were legacy systems in place. And whatever we had to build had to be compatible with it, even if making it compatible is actually a suboptimal solution. We still had to comply with that because it had to uh, work within that ecosystem. We cannot change the entire ecosystem overnight. Uh, and um, uh, making it compliant with the pre-existing ecosystem in many ways actually eroded the advantages that we would otherwise have been able to provide. Um, so uh, this was a challenge. And um, uh, fortunately for us in the recent past, a lot of new initiatives, be it Aadhaar, be it the Jandan Yojana, or the um, uh, new breed of white label ATMs and payment banks, a lot of these things are not so shackled by the conventional architecture and they're affording a lot of opportunities to disrupt the ecosystem through very radical innovation. And I think inherently we have a lead there. So whereas in the legacy uh, environment, um, we were, uh, our own technology edge was there, innovation edge was there, but it was relatively limited because we had to plug ourselves into a pre-existing ecosystem. Now uh, we will be able to blaze very new trails and uh, I think the year ahead will be a lot more exciting than what we have done in the past. So. See, within the last uh, about an year, we have launched uh, three, four different uh, products, if you can call it that, uh, different configurations of the ATM. Um, most recently, we launched in response to the white label and small payment banks uh, initiative, uh, what is probably the world's smallest ATM, what we call as the Ecoteller Mini. And uh, before that, we launched uh, through the wall ATM, which is not very common in India, uh, but is common in certain um, other countries where uh, you have an ATM uh, looking out into the street, whereas the mechanism is inside the premises of the bank. And people don't even have to enter the bank, they just transact from the sidewalk and uh, move on. Uh, the uh, other product that we launched prior to that is called the Eco Teller, which is a full fledged. Um, uh, four cassette ATM, but at a very radically lower uh, energy uh, point, which is meant for deployment almost anywhere where you find a conventional ATM that is deployed. And uh, we are now uh, uh, launching certain software solutions, which uh, will enable small banks and cooperative banks, which do not have a core banking system, to connect to a common cloud-based solution without big investments in either a core banking system or an ATM switch uh, using very contemporary web-based technologies, um, which will uh, help small banks to quickly scale up to the extent that they want. Um, otherwise, the conventional solutions which come with a very large upfront investment uh, are not viable unless the bank is going to have thousands of ATMs. Now, small entities like cooperative banks and others also can quickly ramp up. So 
Uh, these are some of the innovations that we have launched and we will be launching in the near future. Something like 150 million people have been brought into the banking fold through the Jandan uh, scheme in the last year or so. And uh, all of them will require a suite of services, not necessarily the same services that conventional bank customers had. And uh, <coughs> I see that uh, technology will have a very key role to play in uh, delivering services to them. Uh, in order to uh, not only deliver the services, but deliver them at a price point that is affordable by them and uh, in a manner which is uh, readily scalable. So, um, uh, I don't think anywhere else in the world you have had added 150 million people in less than a year. And uh, while the accounts are there, uh, a lot of potential of what can be done through those accounts is not being done today uh, simply because solutions have not been tailored for them. On textiles, we looked at the problem primarily that small producers, cotton growers, weavers were facing. They were all leading a very marginal existence. We are all aware that periodically there are these um, uh, depressing reports about farmers committing suicide and stuff like that. And um, uh, when uh, we looked at this industry as a whole, we found that textiles is the largest employer after agriculture. And uh, as a domain, it is the largest category of aspirational products, something like uh, one in every three apparel is sold through organized retail format, which is not true of food and things like that. Uh, the end customer in terms of willingness to pay for good products, the market is very large and yet the people who are making those products are leading a very marginal existence. And uh, this is due to a lot of structural problems and uh, disintermediation and end-to-end uh, -end flow of uh, material not being streamlined, which makes it very wasteful. So we have developed a patented technology by which you can uh, enable a small group of farmers to add value to the cotton, make it yarn, and then um, dye it, weave it, make end products, all in a local area within a village, uh, and have a turnover of something like 15 crores or 20 crores annually, uh, enabling the primary producers to capture a much larger span of the value chain locally rather than merely selling the primary produce. So this is uh, an initiative that is being driven by another company that I founded um, called Microspin. And uh, the third company that I have founded is called Skillvery, uh, which is focused on using technology as a means to deliver skill training. The idea being that when um, we look at textbook and blackboard kind of knowledge. A lot of things have improved in, the, in maybe the last 10 years or so through what is called e-learning. You have uh, text and visuals and all of that communicated online and people can access those, they can access the best of lectures uh, and uh, learn at their own pace. <coughs> Whereas when it comes to uh, what are called hands-on skills, uh, if I were to talk about plumbing or painting or uh, welding and things like that, we are still uh, teaching people the way things were taught 200 years ago and it's an extremely wasteful and expensive way of imparting skills on the one hand and on the other hand it requires students to commit a very long period of time to skill acquisition. They'll spend one year or two years. So the idea was uh, can you use technology to impart such skills in much shorter time, maybe in a month, two months and at very low cost so that the throughput of skilled persons increases tremendously and uh, the statistics is that formally trained skilled persons today annually are contributing to only 2% of the needs of the economy. So 98% of the people are just informally absorbed into the workforce and they learn often badly learn wrong practices and this is a big challenge. And um, I believe that um, this initiative of ours to use simulators as the means of delivering training which is exact and measurable uh, will be a key driver of the Skill India initiative that India is now um, launching.